Hello and welcome to Premier League All Access with me, Alex Crook. Alongside me, I've got two former Hammers in Scott Minto and Dean Ashton. And here's what's coming up. As food for thought, I thought it was an interesting game. I thought we controlled the game, but in both boxes, they looked a lot better. And that is worrying. When Harry Kane isn't available, I don't think we have somebody who can step up to play. Phil Foden, another underwhelming performance from him in an England show. You know, look, Phil Foden has got to find a way to transfer that form because it's not Manchester City. So what are you going to do about it? What happens, Scott, if Kobe Mainu starts against Belgium, puts in another stellar performance? He looks as if he's been an England international for, for five or six years. It definitely feels like this sort of newer generation are coming in with less fear. Probably we could sit here now and name, what, 20 to 23 man squad? Big, big decisions for, for Gareth. And, and, you know, he's got to get it right. He'll know the pressure that he's, that he's under. Going to this, going to this tournament, because we all expect us to be extremely com competitive and, and win it. Well, this international break in particular just feels like it gets in the way of the running to the Premier League season. Uh, no games for us to cover uh, this weekend. What did you get up to, Dino? I um, just did what I love to do when I'm not watching football, which is still watch football. <laughs> <laughs> um, but it was nice, actually, just to be able to go with some mates, relax in the pub, a bit of family time on Sunday as well. But obviously still still made sure I watched uh, some of the international football, albeit it is hard because the friendlies are what they say. They're, they're time for players just to, to have the time away with the, the, the senior side. But at the same time, you know, don't want to get injured um, and I think are probably protecting themselves. Uh, Scott, I know you were on with Darren Ambrose on Saturday, keeping across all the EFL action. You'd have had eyes on some of the international games as well. Yeah, that's right, mate. Um, I actually went to Colombia, Spain the day before at the London Stadium. And I was in the Colombian end, obviously, and um, took the missus and the kids. And the atmosphere was amazing. I mean, it was the Colombians were just superb. I have to say, I was disappointed with Spain. They obviously didn't have their, their full strength 11 out. But they were typical Spain in the first half and, and pretty poor in the second. So it was a really good win for Colombia. The atmosphere, as I say, was incredible. I worked with Darren. He did really well um, in the daytime. It was a long shift, one till six. <laughs> that was long for him making his debut as a presenter. Then I went for a, a curry and quiz night, another school night. So I didn't watch the England game until Sunday. Um, but it was a busy weekend in the end. Yeah, absolutely. And the Colombian, Mrs Minto, very happy uh, with that scoreline in the right. East End. Uh, when England were playing Brazil, I was wandering around Bristol uh, dressed as AP McCoy. Had to go at curling, actually, uh, myself and Mr Matterface, curling champions of the stag weekend that we were on. So we were quite happy uh, with that. He's not here today, so uh, I'm in the chair. And let's get stuck into some of the football that was on as England slipped up at home against the Brazilians. England nil, Brazil won. Bit of a surprise scoreline in many ways. I think most people fancied England to pick up what would have been a bit of a statement victory uh, heading into the Euros in the summer. Brazil, without several of their first-team regulars, didn't have a, a first choice or even a backup goalkeeper. So one of five debutants in net. But in the end, Dean, it, it was pretty comfortable for the visitors. They were the better side. Um, yeah, I think they looked very, very dangerous on the break. I thought we looked really vulnerable, actually, especially once Carl Walker went off with, uh, with what looks like a, a hamstring tweak. Um, and, and actually, Vinicius Junior was in behind him, even you know when he actually when he actually did that injury. And that that's I think that's a big worry in terms of what the best teams all look to do against England, which is expose our our two centre backs. And I think again, it shows. We are in need of pace at the back because we're, we're going to have players that um, that get forward, that look to attack, and teams can sit knowing we maybe haven't got that pace, especially if Walker isn't in the team. Um, that was the biggest thing I took from the from the game was that kind of weakness on the break for for England, and and the fact that we're still very very good from set plays, very very dangerous. And people might say, oh well, we've got to do more than that, and we have. But it's such a great weapon to have going into a, a tournament. We can't forget how useful that was um, when we got to the semi-final of the, of the World Cup. Scott, that isn't going to change, though, is it, between now and Germany, that lack of pace 
the heart of the defence in particular because Harry Maguire, with the greatest respect in the world, he won't get any quicker uh, between now and then. We, we haven't really got anybody putting serious pressure on Maguire, despite the fact that I think his form at, at club level maybe doesn't necessarily justify being a guaranteed England starter. Lewis Dunk obviously came on uh, at the weekend. He came in for a bit of criticism for his part in the goal. Is this... Is this the big headache for Gareth Southgate? If there's one area in the team that is going to stop England going all the way in Germany, is it at the centre of defence? Look, I, I think defensively is is not our strongest department. Um, you know, I, I, I found it interesting that everyone's sort of having a go at Harry Maguire. And yet for that incident where, where Dino was talking about, that's actually Carl Walker letting Vinicius Jr. go and him going in behind John Stones. You know, and then there was a chance uh, with the goal of course, where Harry Maguire wasn't even on the pitch. Again, Esri Konza, and I looked at it and I paused it as well at the, at the point of the pass. And you could see the three players, our three players, were not even in the line. So there's no communication from Esri Konza to, Konza to uh, John Stones. And, you know, this is not just a Harry Maguire thing. This is, a, are we able to communicate? And the art of communication seems to have gone a little bit from a, a right back who's not normally a right back to his centre back. And, I, I, you know, I, I think it's slightly harsh. Yes, Harry Maguire made one mistake and Rafinha should have uh, taken control of it. But whenever he's played in the tournaments, I think he's done really well. I think, again, he's a bit of a scapegoat, to be honest with you. And what they need is protection. And I think it probably what we saw in the game against Brazil was Gareth Southgate's argument, which is kind of against what I've been arguing for, because I want a 4-3-3, th three, three, is that you need two pivots in there. You need two people to protect that back four. So, you know, Pakatar turning Conor Gallagher, they're not suddenly one ball in behind. So there's food for thought. I thought it was an interesting game. I thought we controlled the game, but in both boxes, they looked a lot better. And that is worrying. A couple of worrying performances for me. Ollie Watkins, first and foremost, missed a really decent chance in the first half. I think that just highlights that when Harry Kane isn't available, I don't think we have somebody who can step up to the plate. I Watkins has done brilliant in the Premier League this year but he isn't Harry Kane. Ivan Tony on the international stage, we're yet to really see what he can do. And maybe more alarmingly, bearing in mind that I think he's possibly a contender for the Premier League's Player of the Year, Phil Foden, another underwhelming performance from him in an England shirt. What, do you, what did you make of those two, Dean? Um, I, I think it, it it's becoming um, a regular theme that players that have looked fantastic in the Premier League have then gone to England, maybe not been able to replicate that exact form, then England aren't playing the same way as probably are with their with their club sides. And um, I think it's fair to say that Gareth Southgate isn't Pep Guardiola, if you're talking about Phil Foden. So, that, so there is that disparity, but we'd expect it to get closer than that. And I think obviously Phil Foden started on the, on the, on the right and drifted in, but never looked dangerous in the penalty area, which is where he's been looking so dangerous. Um, for, for Manchester City. It, Ollie Watkins, I think, it's a bit unfair. He's getting one opportunity. You know, Harry Kane will play 10, 15, 20 England games on the bounce. And then we'll see over that scope where he's at. Ollie Watkins has been absolutely brilliant in the Premier League. You don't do it to the level he has if you're not an, an outstanding player. I think it, it always feels harsh when, you, when you're giving one player one chance and you're saying this is it this is your chance if you don't play well or you don't score just for the record by the way that was actually brilliant defending it wasn't a miss from Watkins um the defender whacked it against his his foot so I thought he was a bit harshly treated in in that but again it's it's difficult when when you're playing those games and there isn't anything on it um the pressure's on that that is England that is England to a T is you know incredible amounts of pressure on a game sometimes that doesn't matter and certain players may be protecting themselves and I, I can understand why really really difficult at times to then shine. Uh, Dino's appraisal there on Gareth Southgate was uh, more polite than some uh, of the callers we had on TalkSport over the course of the weekend when he said he's not Pep Guardiola. Is the fact that Foden doesn't do it for England. Is, is is that a stick to beat Southgate with, that he can't get the best out of such a, a talented player? Yeah, I, I think it is. I mean, look, the, he, he's not Pep Guardiola. We know that. Um, and England aren't Manchester City and they don't dominate in the way that City do. 
you know, the match stats say that they had 53% of, of possession. And even against Brazil, City probably would have had 60%. Um, you know, look, Phil Foden has got to find a way to transfer that form because it's not Manchester City. So what are you going to do about it? Are you going to just turn around and keep on moaning that it's not? Um, or are you going to find a way to do it? He started on the right. That's really probably his best position, or he's come out and said that. I personally like to see him down the middle, but he did play number 10 then when Bellingham went off. And he still, as Dino said, didn't find a way to to really make a difference in the game. And he, he's got to be able to do that. And you look at Jude Bellingham playing in that position. You know, he was, he was always getting involved. He was always finding pockets of space. He was, if he was drift, drifting out wide, he was putting balls in. You know, he, he was absolutely everywhere. And even if you just look at that sort of, the short time that both played the number 10 role within the same game, Jude Bellingham was was a lot more effective. And that's something which I think Phil Foden has to find a way to to transfer that City form into, into England because it ain't Manchester City. And what are you going to do about it? Let's talk about uh, one debutant in particular. You guys know that I'm a massive fan already of Kobe Maynard. I was excited when he got the call up. I think he, I think he did his reputation the world of good when he came on. Unlike Conor Gallagher, who obviously wasn't a debutant, but maybe is one of those players who perhaps is on the borderline as to whether he'll actually make the cut for the tournament. What happens, Scott, if Kobe Mainu starts against Belgium, puts in another stellar performance? D- does that enhance his chances of going and there, therefore maybe put Gallagher on the standby list? Well, I think Gallagher would be there, whatever. But I, I still think that, you know, because Gallagher can play a, a couple of positions. He has done for Chelsea, but... Kobe Maynard, we spoke about this last week, didn't we? About, you know, we, we felt he should have been in the squad anyway. And OK, Gareth Southgate's put him in. I mean, how comfortable did he look when he came on? Especially with that little sort of pirouette turn when when I think Joao Gomez wanted to, to get tight to him. He looked as if he's been an England international for, for five or six years. And, and Dino knows what it's like to try and embed yourself in. And I totally agree with the, the Ollie Watkins. A lot of pressure in one game. What are you going to do? And if Ivan Tony suddenly plays really well, it looks like he's ahead of him now. It's unfair, but it is what it is. And with uh, Kobe Mainu, I thought he was sensational. And he, he looks like that typical youngster that doesn't even realise he's playing for England and all the nerves. And I, I, you can't put a price on that. You really can't. So if he plays well, and I'd like to see him start against Belgium, then absolutely he can make a late run and, and be in the squad. And is this what Gareth is looking for when he gives a young player like Manu a chance, Dean? Not necessarily his football ability, but his mentality, what he's been like in and around the squad this week, what he's like on the biggest stage of all at Wembley, playing against one of the most iconic nations. And he took it all in his stride. It definitely feels like this sort of newer generation are coming in with less fear. That's, that's how it feels to me. Bellingham's come in and, and owned it straight away. I know he's going to be... I'm sure when, you know, when 10, 15, 20 years down the line, we're going to talk about Bellingham as one of the best ever for England. But just in terms of that mentality coming in as such a young player, Maynou's done the same. He's done it at Manchester United. Now he's, he's already shown it with England in a, in a small cameo that they're not affected, it seems, by the pressures that maybe others, others feel with the national side. And I think that is important. I think it is something that, that Gareth will be looking at. Um, and I think that, you know, going into Euros, I, I can't see why if he doesn't start against Belgium and I expect him to and, and, and probably play well, that he'll have, he'll have walked himself into this into this squad because there is space in that in that midfield area. But it's, 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 it's difficult for Southgate when you think he's giving debutants now so close to the European Championships and, and players that we're still not sure on um, that have got international experience I think it's it's a it's a difficult one for Gareth in that sense and there's potentially only really one wild card slot isn't there you, you probably can't envisage a situation where he takes Kobe Mainu and Jarrah Branthwaite for example if he's going to take one young player to give them tournament experience it is going to be either or isn't it because probably we could sit here now and name what 20 to 23 man squad yeah I think I think um I think in terms of those May, uh, yeah, one or two spots we're looking at, aren't we? And, and, and it depends on how Gareth sees it. I, I think the striker situation is going to be interesting, whether he drops a striker out and therefore gives that extra spot in midfield or, or in defence. I think from now until the Euros injuries are going to be key also for some of those those fringe players. It feels like Jared Bowen might be one of those also. 
Um, big, big decisions for, for Gareth. And, and, you know, he's got to get it right. He'll know the pressure that he's, that he's under going to this, going to this tournament because we all expect us to be extremely com- competitive and, and win it. Mm. Throw, at Crookie, throw in Anthony Gordon as well. You know, who yeah. you talk about debuts. I mean, I loved how he spoke as well, both before and after the game. And, you know, he always wanted to play for England. This was his dream. Afterwards, the best day of my life. There's your statement there. You know, OK, yeah. And I heard someone say he hasn't got married and had kids yet. Um, but that's the best day of his life up until now. And, and the way he played and the way he spoke afterwards, you can tell he's not phased by it. I think the question was after the game, you know, do, do you, do you, are you confident you can be in the squad? And it was a yes, I'm confident in myself. I believe in my ability and I believe that I can do whatever I need to do in whatever game I'm in. And again, that mentality, I completely agree with Dino that there's a, there's a group of players coming up now that don't seem phased by playing for England and, you know, with the media on side and, and the majority of the public as well. You still, it's still that sort of jeopardy about, you know, you're, you're playing for your country in a major tournament, but they don't seem to be phased by it. And Anthony Gordon's another one. I'm telling you now, there's a couple that have come in that have made their debuts and, and absolutely will leave Gareth scratching his head about what he does for that 23. Before we look ahead to what the team makeup might be on Tuesday night, either live uh, on TalkSport, once again against Belgium, talk to me about that left-back position, Scott. You know uh, how important it is. Ben Chilwell, what did you make of his performance? Is he a player who looks more suited as a left-wing back than a left-back? And with Luke Shaw injured, is that another potential headache for Gareth? Well, yeah, I mean, you know, Gareth said after the game he was really pleased with him. I think it's somewhere in between, you know, what people are saying about him and what Gareth said. Look, he's he's had a lot of injuries um, over the last couple of years, but this season as well. And I think that has been a problem. I don't think he's 100% match fit as yet. There were a couple of crosses that, that weren't too good. I thought he defended pretty well. I like him. I think he's good. And I think he's got that mentality as well. Is left wing, wing back more suited? Maybe. But can he play left back? Absolutely. I, I really think he can. Um, I, I, I Yes, of course you want Luke Shaw fit and the two of them uh, going. But... I get the feeling that even if Ben Chilwell was fit and Luke Shaw isn't, Gareth may well go with Kieran Trippier if he's fit to left back. And as much as I think he's a fantastic safe pair of hands, there's no doubt about it. A left footed player playing left back gives a lot better balance to the side. Next up for England at Wembley, it is Belgium. Uh, Lucky not to lose the Republic of Ireland at the weekend. Our producer, Jeremy, is a proud Irishman. He's written in the script. They should be beating Teams like Ireland comfortably. In fact, everybody in world football, he says, uh, should beat Ireland comfortably. We might talk about Evan Ferguson and his penalty miss later in the programme. But what do we want to see from this game? Uh, should Cobby Maino start? We're assuming that Ivan Tony will come in up front. Branthwaite, maybe. Madison tried out in the number 10 role. But what sort of 11 do you want from Gareth Southgate, Dino? I think all of the above. I think it's a, a great opportunity. I think maynu has got to play for me to, to really see him in that in that role. I'd like to see him alongside Rice. I'd like to see Rice play it, play again, if, I, if I'm honest. Um, why would you not play Branthwaite as that left-hand side in centre-back, especially with Maguire um, leaving the squad and uh, going back to Manchester United? Obviously, as a forward, it's for me, it's Tony. It's going to be his. It feels like it's his opportunity. Obviously, um, Watkins got plenty of minutes against Brazil. It feels like Tony's going to get the same against Belgium, and as Scott said, as harsh as it is, and it doesn't, it doesn't feel fair, and it's not. But it's now his. He'll have been sat there, thinking, "I, I hope Watkins. I hope we win, and Watkins doesn't play well." <laughs> as, as horrible as that sounds, that that's what you think because you think then he's now got the opportunity to do something, score goals, play well, have a real influence, and put himself possibly ahead of ahead of Watkins, if anything, just within the fans, the media's eyes from this international break to say everyone's got Tony on their lips rather than rather than Watkins. And that's how brutal these international breaks are. What about you, Scott? What are you hoping for on Tuesday night? Yeah, do you know what? The, the, the words that came out of Dino's mouth, first of all, were exactly what I was about to say, all of the above. I think this is the one where you can experiment. And, and Ivan Tony, you know, again, Dino spot on. It's not that you want anyone to play badly. You just don't want them to play well. 
And, you know, Wally Watkins didn't score. He, he, he didn't sort of run the channels and he wanted to. I mean, look, he was trying to do what he does for Aston Villa, whereas, you know, sometimes he's got to adapt his game to to what's happening. And and Harry Kane is not the athlete that, that, that Watkins is, but he finds a way of dropping off, playing, getting more involved and then getting into the box as well. So I think Ivan Tony has got a wonderful opportunity. I'd love to see Kobe Mainu start. And and that balance at the back with with Brand Frank and his left left foot, you know, I, I think this is the one where, despite us losing to Brazil, people will understand if it's an experimental side and we lose to Belgium, even if they didn't beat the Republic of Ireland, whatever Jeremy says, um, you just look at players. You just look at players. The one disappointing thing I'd say about Brazil, actually, I, I chatted with Adrian Durham uh, before the show when I was on with with Darren, and he was absolutely spot on about finding a way to win in the last 20 minutes. And by making the substitutes that we made, it's almost washing your hands of, well, we, you know, he played and he's played. And I get it. We've we've had positives like Kobe Mainu coming on. But the question mark against Gareth Southgate is, can he find a way to win a game when it's really, really tight? And we didn't find that against Brazil. Um, so it's going to be interesting to see what happens. But I think this is the experimental side that I want to see. You say the result isn't important. I disagree with that. I think if they lose both these friendlies, we know that Gareth Southgate enjoys an uneasy relationship with a lot of England supporters, maybe a lot of the England media as well. If if they lose both matches so close to a major tournament, I think he could come in for a bit of stick. And this isn't a vintage Belgium side. We all remember how limply they exited the World Cup. They did only manage a draw against Ireland at the weekend. I think as much as it is probably going to be a chance for some of the the fringe players to shine. I think they do need to win the game, Dino, at home against a pretty ordinary Belgium side. They don't. <laughs> they don't because he's got to look at, he has to look at the players. He has to. And of course he, he'll want to win the game. And, and he's right. We had plenty of the game against Brazil without maybe being the best in, in the penalty areas. But it's, it's not. I think it's so much more important that he gets to have a look at the players. Otherwise, what's the point in taking them? What is the point in taking these players and giving them debuts and not having a proper look at them if all you're worried about is the supporters being a little bit disgruntled when they already are anyway? And actually, probably take the pressure um, pressure off slightly because we'll all go, oh, well, we've got no chance now. You know, we we can't beat Brazil second string and we can't beat you know, a, a, a poor Belgian side. So I, I think Gareth is strong enough to, to not worry about that and, and get out of this what he needs to because he's got some really, really difficult decisions to make in the, in the summer as to who is in that squad. You know, there's going to be some really disappointed players. And does he, does he go with the tried and tested and, the, and, and the, 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 those players? Or does he go with some fresh new players that have only just come in. It's it's that's the big decision and I think he's got to get that out of this this break. Crookie, from a from an aesthetic point of view, yes, of course, he, he needs to win after the loss. He wants to keep the walls from the door. And and I'm thinking of you in particular. Um <laughs> but, but it honestly he has to play the players. He has to under this is the it, well, I don't know if it's the last game now before he names the squad, but he has to look at the players in the squad because the next squad he kind of picks up is he needs to kind of know what it is. So, of course, no one wants to lose. You want to win. But the most important thing in this particular game now is the final look at the players who could sneak through that uh, that door and, and get on the plane. Uh, there have been a couple of additions uh, to the squad over the course of the weekend as well. James Trafford and Rico Lewis have been promoted. Uh, Rico Lewis, who did so well when he got his chance last time around. James Trafford, one of the heroes of England, winning the under-21 European Championships. Uh, that's because uh, Sam Johnston has picked up a shoulder problem. Harry Maguire is undergoing a scan for a potential injury as well. And no Carl Walker in the squad for Tuesday night. The Trafford one, Dean, very quickly, is a little bit surprising because this was a young goalkeeper who signed for Burnley for big money. His reputation was enhanced by what he did at the under-21 championships. I don't think he's been great this season. Does that suggest a little bit of a, a lack of strength in depth in the goalkeeping departments, bearing in mind that most of Jordan Pickford's understudies aren't even number one for their clubs? I think it's quite an easy decision for Gareth to then not throw somebody more senior in to maybe say to them, you have got a chance when he knows they've not for the for the actual Euros. And if he's going to maybe take a third, he might take, 
you know, an under-21 goalkeeper. And, and he has done that, to be fair, he's done that throughout his, his time with England. He has very much promoted the under-21s. When he, whenever he can, he has done that. And I've loved that about Gareth, because when you're in the 21s, there's nothing worse than feeling like you've put, sort of put in the work under 17s, 19, 20, 21s. The whole, the whole thing that you, you, you're told is that you're getting the experience with England so that you can just seamlessly go into the senior side to then just see journeyman players maybe get a few caps, but, but not get not really feature. I think Gareth's just gone. We don't even do that. We just we promote the twenty ones and give them the the experience. So, to me, that's a plus. Albeit Trafford hasn't been great. A reminder: England against Belgium live on Talk Sport on Tuesday night. It's seven forty five kickoff with Adrian and the team. Okay, let's wrap up some of the other news knocking around the Premier League and beyond over the course of the weekend. And we'll start with Wales. They have a huge game in Cardiff on Tuesday night, a chance to secure their place at the European Championships. They take on Poland in a one-off playoff. Uh, winner takes all. They were brilliant, Wales, in destroying Finland on Thursday. And what struck me, Scott, about this Welsh team now is they're not reliant on a superstar uh, like Gareth Bale or even Aaron Ramsey. But I do think, quietly, They've got a little bit more strength in depth about their team now. They've got players like Brennan Johnson, who's playing regularly in the Premier League, uh, players who are doing well at the top end of the Championship. Ampadu in midfield caught the eye. And, and I think Robert Page deserves a lot of credit for rebuilding a team without those two star names. No, absolutely. I mean, like Aaron Ramsey's he's sort of back in the squad, but, you know, wasn't starting. And, and he hasn't been the sort of major star that, that he's been and obviously with Gareth Bale gone I think when you think about the pressure that was on Rob Page because they were poor in the World Cup really poor um, and I don't know behind the scenes if there's still been patched up between him and the, and the CEO of the Welsh Association but I think this is a massive game for him I really do I thought they were excellent I think he's done very well I think no one can take the place of Gareth Bale but Harry Wilson I think has been superb you mentioned Ethan Ampadu 50th cap in that game against Finland, the youngest ever for Wales. I wouldn't have said that. You know, you think of Ryan Giggs and even Gareth Bale himself, the youngsters that have come through, and Ethan Amadou has done that. that that's incredible. I think he's been brilliant. And and David Brooks as well. You know, what a wonderful story for him to come back and, and score that opening goal after what he's gone through. So I think Wales are what they are. They're, they're, they're a sum of the parts. They've got some very good players. And again, what Rob Page has done, he's told a lot of the players who weren't playing regular football at the start of the season, you need to go out and find it. And there's a few that have gone out alone, playing, playing well. And I think we see that now reflecting uh, in this particular Wales performance. But I tell you what, the Poland game, I I I'm glad it's at Wales because Poland have some very, very good players indeed. Yeah, David Brooks at Casing Point, actually one of those players who wanted to go out and play regular football. Bournemouth certainly weren't pushing him out the door. In fact, I think Andoni Iriola wanted him to stay and be part of the squad, but he was determined to go and get regular first-team football with these playoffs and potentially the Euros in mind. And good luck to him. He's a brilliant guy. And as you say, he's had some really difficult times off the pitch. Scott's alluded to it there, Dean. Poland, they just always seem to be there or thereabouts when it comes to a major tournament, certainly in terms of qualification anyway. Uh, they beat... Estonia 5-1 in their playoff semi-final. Estonia did have a man sent off very early in that game. Uh, Lewandowski started, didn't score, uh, which is a surprise considering they got five goals. How big a step up in opponent is this for Wales? I think it is, but I think Poland have, have been poor as well in, in major tournaments over over the last decade they or so. Them, even, they even, always qualify. Yeah, 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 they do. They do. But I actually think this is going to be really, really close because what Wales have got that Poland haven't is that kind of youthful speed about them. And Poland don't, but, but they have proven quality at the very, very highest level players and experience. So I think when you marry those two um, those two up between the two sides, I think that's what's going to make it interesting. You know, Wales brought on Dan James at the weekend. You know, that sort of pace that Poland are going to have to face at times. Um, Keeper Moore, another very difficult player to, to play against. But, you, you know, I think, I, I do feel like this is such a great opportunity for Wales. And again, 
This would be a ridiculous achievement again for a country the size of Wales to qualify for another major tournament with the resources they've got. I mean, it, it just says so much about um, them as a them as a nation and, and what they've been able to build in terms of um, the character within these squads and the link between themselves and the supporters. And you're right, it's going to need to be a, a collective effort with fans and players. Yeah, the atmosphere in Cardiff is going to be red hot. Simon Jordan might disagree uh, with some of his comments building up to, to the Finland game, but I think it'd be great if we could get three home nations there. England and Scotland have already qualified. Wales uh, will certainly bring a lot to the party as well. We'll have extensive updates uh, from that game during uh, England against Belgium on Talk Sport on Tuesday. Uh, elsewhere at the weekend, Germany picked up a confidence-boosting victory over France. Kai Havertz of Arsenal uh, on the score sheet once again. I think a lot of people, Scott, have sort of written Germany off after what we saw at the World Cup, but they are the hosts. Again, when it comes to a major tournament, quite often they manage to pull something out of the bag when you don't expect them to. Are they a potential dark horse in the draw? Do you know what, Crookie? I, I honestly don't know. And up until this game against France, I'd have said no. Now, that, this will give them a lot of confidence. And to score after eight seconds, I think, certainly helps. You almost, you're basically starting the game 1-0 up. Not as quick as Darren Ambrose's goal, of course, in the TalkSport All-Stars uh, <laughs> game. It wasn't even the fastest goal of the international weekend. There was a, I know. a goal in the Austria oh, yeah. game after six seconds. That's right. Yeah, he beat him by a second or so. Um, but I think what you've got in Julian Nagelsmann is a very clever coach. Um, they've been so poor since they won the World Cup in 2014. that, And, and up until now, you're kind of thinking, mm, no, I just don't see it. But you almost think, well, they're the Germans. They're, 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 they're going to come good. They're, the tournament is at home. I still think they're sort of quarterfinals at very best semifinals. But this, albeit France having some players out, Griezmann being one of them, and Mbappe still played, and there were still some very good players against a very good France side. Maybe it told us more about France than it did about Germany and the, and the mentality they had going into that particular game. But... Um, but look, I think that's a great win for Germany, you have to say. And it's perhaps just given France a kick up the backside, maybe, that they needed. Uh, we've alluded to this already, but Evan Ferguson did miss a penalty in that Ireland against Belgium game. 20 games without a goal for him uh, for club and country. Now, of course, he's still only a young player, but this was somebody who, before he signed his new deal at Brighton, was being talked about as a possible £100 million target for the likes of Manchester United. Dean Ashton... I'm not sure you ever had a 20-game goal drought, but what advice would you give Evan Ferguson and what's happened to him? Well, I had a very similar run uh, of not scoring. I think it might have been 10 to 15 games around very similar age to him as well in terms of coming in, making a real impact, making it look easy and probably feel easy this game up against you know older top pros and scoring goals like it's just playing with your mates in the street and and then becomes the expectation and if you if you also look at the fact that he's he's not really playing he's sort of in and out he's on the bench yet we will still judge him on every single one of those games if he comes on for 5 minutes or 50 minutes and doesn't score well it's another game you haven't scored and and people will then build that up and make it look like you are absolutely useless when if we really look at the amount of time he's played and had consistent game time, as in four, five, six games starting, which he hasn't had. The Zerbi, I actually think, has treated him quite poorly in, in that sense, when you've got somebody that's got the talents that he, that he has. Um, and, prob and then the penalty misses confidence, because you then lose that feeling as a young player that it's easy. You, you start to feel the pressure yourself. He'll come through it. He's, he's, a, he's a brilliant player. And, and again... It, it, of course, it's difficult to watch and, and it's easy to put the, the numbers up there. Um, but if you look at it as a whole, he's going to be a, a terrific player. Uh, just before we go, we have to talk once again uh, about profit and sustainability. Uh, we were actually in the bar, Dino, at the TalkSport Trophy uh, on Friday night when we heard that Leicester uh, had been uh, charged by the Premier League. Now, this is an interesting one because I think Leicester tried to exploit a bit of a loophole uh, by not handing in their accounts to the EFL uh, to get away with not being sanctioned by them because they claim they're a Premier League club at the time when those accounts were filed. 
and they were trying to get off a Premier League charge because they're now a championship club. It, it looks like any points penalty will be applied next season. That's not going to go down well with the likes of Southampton and Leeds and Ipswich who are competing with them for promotion back to the Premier League. Legally, this could be a bit of a minefield. Well, I'll tell you what, you need to answer your own question there really quickly because you'll, you, you'll, you'll know about this more than us. But, you know, all I can say is, yeah, well, you know, the offshoots and the legal routes that people might want to go down, as you've mentioned, of those teams. I mean, look, how, how can it can it get sorted before the end of the season? No, it can't. It's too late on, especially with appeals and, and, and all kind of stuff like that. So it has to go into the summer. We all, I think, agree that we don't want the end of the season, and we talk about the Premier League with this as well, don't want it to be decided after the Premier League season finishes. So in one sense, absolutely take it into the following season. But I would imagine from a legal point of view, and I'm no lawyer, that the other clubs in the EFL chasing that automatic promotion spot and don't get it, and don't go up, would have a case on their hands. Yeah, I, I think that um, what, I, what I'm finding, and Crookie, you can maybe... Um, sort of give some clarity on this as well um, because I know we we're in the bar but you were still actually across it um, and it, it's be- the to price. me it seems it, it's, it's, to me it seems as if obviously since these these um, sort of legislations have been, been brought in it's almost like clubs are trying to get back in line because for years they've obviously almost had free reign and they're, they're now having to claw their way back and some some clubs seemingly aren't haven't been able to to do that and also the authorities aren't in line in terms of with the legality of it all are they able to do it quick enough you know it's almost as if no one's quite still ready for for all of this crookie and then you know we could now be left with a situation like scott's talked about where it's not sorted by the end of this that would be absolute madness and it would be a terrible stain on the premier league and its integrity if that if that happens how do we get around how how do we get around it well i think it's almost impossible to get around it when it comes to leicester because uh, they're also not subject to the same time scales that say forest and everton are because they're not a premier league club the rules have been changed actually in terms of trying to get everything sorted by a certain date since they left the premier league so they can legally drag their heels for as long as they want this this might not be sorted for several months when it comes to forest and everton and everton uh, have their independent commission for their second uh, PSR charge this very week. I think that will be sorted before the final round of fixtures. It, it simply has to be, otherwise it damages the brand almost irreparably. We will, of course, keep you uh, up to date with all that across the TalkSport network. Busy week as well uh, in terms of uh, live football. England, Belgium, uh, Tuesday night on Talk Sport. We've got Women's Champions League action on Wednesday as Chelsea host Ajax in the second leg uh, of their quarter final. That's live on TalkSport 2 at 8 o'clock. Good Friday, uh, Easter weekend on the horizon. Uh, four live championship commentaries on TalkSport 2, plus the usual uh, around-the-ground service with Adrian Durham uh, on TalkSport. I think Dean and I are pretty much at a game every day uh, over Easter. We will be back with you uh, before Easter weekend with a full preview of the return of the Premier League. Dean Scott, thanks for your time. Are the the knees all right, Dean, after your heroics on Friday? Oh, absolute tin man, honestly. (laughs) Oh, crikey. Why did I bother? But to be honest, as you well know, Crookie, it's more my ego that was wounded when the team sheet was read out at the start of the game and Crook's name was on instead of Ashton. Wow. I can't believe that. Do you know what? I did think when he was in the wall, I thought he would, he, he did really well. But then the game carried on and it, it looked like he was still in the wall for the rest of the match. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, it's good what? to see you out there. You, 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 you were man-marking each other at one point. Uh, <laughs> yeah. yeah, the non-pro stuck together. We, we played a game actually on the Stag weekend and it, and it was nice to play against... Uh, you know, non-former Premier League players. It helped restore the confidence. I even got a goal in that game. So I think I'll probably stick to that in the future. Well, I think those well, highlights are still available <laughs> on YouTube, by the way, if you so fancy. Dean Scott, thanks for your company. We'll be back on Thursday afternoon looking ahead to all the big Premier League games.
there's food for thought. I thought it was an interesting game. I thought we controlled the game, but in both boxes, they looked a lot better. And that is worrying. When Harry Kane isn't available, I don't think we have somebody who can step up to play. Phil Foden, another underwhelming performance from him in an England shirt. You know, look, Phil Foden has got to find a way to transfer that form because it's not Manchester City. So what are you going to do about it? What happens, Scott, if Kobe Mainu starts against Belgium, puts in another stellar performance? He looks as if he's been an England international for, for five or six years. It definitely feels like this sort of newer generation are coming in with less fear. Probably we could sit here now and name, what, 20 to 23 man squad? Big, big decisions for, for Gareth. And, and, you know, he's got to get it right. He'll know the pressure that he's, that he's under going to this 